Katie, I'm excited to chat with you today about uh, Kids in Crisis, Kids in Crisis Sunday. We're actually here at uh, Love Inc. Yes. and it's open, they're getting ready for Christmas stuff, stuff's going on here. Yes. And uh, this is cool because it's the location of our foster care supply mm -hmm. closet. Yes, right Just over my shoulder. Right over there. Yeah. Which is part of our Kids in Crisis ministry. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that ministry, why it's important and what it is, Absolutely. and why Kids in Crisis Sunday, what that is all about? So the Kids in Crisis ministry is really an initiative that came from us looking into the community that our church is in to see where the needs existed. And safe and healthy children, children that had a safe place to live, people around them that cared and would, would support them and encourage them and help them to grow. Uh, that's something that, that was a huge need that existed through foster care and kinship care, which is when a kiddo needs to be removed from maybe the care of their parents, but a family member takes them. So that foster care element and that kinship care element is a huge need, not only for people to step into those roles, but also to come alongside and around those friends that do that uh, to just provide support and care and essential things. And so as a church, uh, we want to do that. So we want to not only provide for those needs, but also inform and encourage the body of Christ to just learn about those things and then step in and be a part of that, whatever that looks like for them. So this Kids in Crisis Sunday is really a time to re-engage and reconnect with our entire church to just let them know what's going on all year long. Not only the needs that exist, but the way that they can step into being a part of uh, supporting those needs. So we use the word crisis and kids in crisis. Yes. What's this crisis we're dealing with right now in our city, in our state, in our country? That's a great question because uh, specifically as it relates to uh, kids in crisis and foster care, our state has well over a thousand kiddos in need of temporary and sometimes long-term care through fostering. Uh, in Pennington County alone, it's well over 400. And we're, we're growing in our number of foster families, but the need is still very great. There are still under 100 foster families that are serving hundreds and hundreds of kids. And so uh, the need is great because they just don't have safe places to go. So they're, they're literally being removed from not only their homes, but also their schools and, and their neighborhoods because they're having to go live in places where there are foster families available. And so um, what we wanna do is first and foremost, uh, pay attention to the needs and then lean in and care for the foster families that are here and make sure that they're able to sustain and thrive as they're doing this good work. And then maybe empower others to come alongside and consider being a foster family or providing respite care, which is just temporary care uh, on a weekend, or just to give families a break as they're serving so much. But really, um, not only make sure that people know that this is going on, but find a way that they can step in and, and care because uh, hundreds of kids in our community not being able to have a safe place to go, is that's a huge issue. That should matter to all of us. Where are they in the interim? Um, in the interim, a lot of times they're staying in temporary care provider homes or that, that have a lot of kids uh, or they're staying at the DSS office here in town. They're sleeping in conference rooms and being cared for by people who whose job it is to care for these kids and to help them find safe places, but not to um, not to sit with them in a conference room, you know, overnight. So uh, we just want to make sure that people are paying attention and know what's going on and then however they can step in, lean in uh, and, and be part of helping everybody thrive and have what they need. So kids need long and short term foster care? Yes. Yes. What do those time periods look like usually? So uh, temporary care providers, it's it's usually uh, no more than 72 hours where there's a kiddo that's been removed from their home and while uh, while they're looking maybe for a family member that could take care of them or a full-time foster placement, uh, it's just a safe place to go and be encouraged and supported and, and just be safe uh, in that interim of time. And then there are more long-term uh, some kids will be in foster care until they get adopted. Others will be until mom and dad are able to get healthy and well and, and they can go back. That's really our heart and hope is that we can even as a church help those parents that might have their kids taken away for a season be able to, to grow and thrive and be able to, to have reunification. Uh, but the story looks different for everybody, but our, our hope is that in, in the time and space that they are in that need that we're able to come alongside and provide support as a church. So we have kids that are in need, they're sleeping in conference rooms sometimes, yeah. 
And on the other side, we have families that are probably overwhelmed because there's yes. so few families and so many kids. Yes. How do we support the families that are in need? So uh, at the church, we have something called a wraparound care team. So every foster family or kinship family, again, those kinship families are grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle. Uh, we, we link them up with a point of contact who is essentially the bridge between them and the church. So they're connecting with them regularly, supporting them however they need and letting us know how, how we can help them. So that happens in a variety of ways. We have a home repair team that leans in and is needed, will help with home repairs around the house. Uh, we Just to lift some of the hurdles and take care of some of the things that we can. We provide meals for them. We have a team that prays for our foster families that just commits to intercede on their behalf and come alongside them that way. Um, and then things like this foster supply closet where we're able to respond with urgent needs so a kiddo might they might realize with this first snow that they don't have any snow gear that fits because last year maybe they've they've uh, right. they've run out of them. Um, they've they've grown out of them, and so uh, even even things like that, responding by providing things like boots or gloves or coats. Uh, it's it's just leaning into tangible needs and also walking alongside for that emotional and spiritual support because it's a lot to carry, and it's a lot easier when we do it together. So that's one of the number one ways, aside from the foster care supply closet. There are other things too, like advocacy, just learning about what's going on in the community and in the state, and, and trying to help clear the path so that maybe there's early intervention for families or other options so that they just don't have to get to that point even. So you mentioned coats and boots to the supply closet. Yes. We're actually doing a coat drive right now. Yes. This week and hopefully people are bringing coats back to the church. Yes. Uh, how yes. do we, <laughs> yeah, yes, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, we can provide warmth for kids yes. in need. Um, yes. Are there other, st other steps like that on a regular basis people can bring stuff to, or can they bring coats still today? Yeah, um, really for as long as they would like, gloves, hats, coats, new or gently used. We're also going to do boots, but shoes are a little harder, so we'll do those on a specific case-by-case -case basis. Um, but our, our hope is several times a year. We did a school supply drive uh, this summer, but intermittently throughout the year, mobilizing the church to uh, provide specific needs, large-scale needs that we know not only foster families in our church will need, um, but in the community as a whole. Uh, we have the privilege of being able to partner with a number of organizations and even other churches and schools to be able to help really any and every foster kiddo or kinship kiddo that needs help. Uh, and so things like the winter coat drive, the, this Kids in Crisis uh, coat drive, it's a huge opportunity to be able to meet a tangible need. You might not be able to foster a kiddo or even be a point of contact or a wraparound team member, uh, but we want to invite you to be a part of it in some way because everybody can do something. And yeah. so that's just a huge way to do it. And there really is no time limit right now. It's cold here for a long time. Uh, so uh, our, our hope is to be able to not only provide immediate uh, needs for those kiddos, but to be able to have some on hand as as um, throughout the winter, there are still those needs yeah. that come up that we're able to respond uh, and and just have good stewardship as we do it. So when I see lovely neighbor bags in the lobby, that should be a warning sign to me, flashing, saying, "Hey, there's a need, and I can help fill fulfill that need by grabbing a bag." Yes, absolutely. Again, we just want to um, honor the church, the body of Christ does so much. Uh, to help one another throughout the years because uh, it costs money to do what we're doing. Um, but there's something about being able to know exactly what's needed and to be able to fill a bag and bring it and know that you're able to do something. Um, because I think no matter what, when we're all being a part of it in one way or another, we just make, make what's heavy a little lighter. So our heart as an outreach ministry is to really just help provide opportunities for each and every person uh, to step into God's calling in their lives, in their community. We want to just help you find ways to use your gifts and your passions to serve. And Kids in Crisis might be that for a lot of people. So uh, we try to provide so many opportunities to make it just simple and easy to step in. And one of those ways is through the coat drive. So bringing winter gear stuff. If that's all you can do in this season, thank you, because that's huge, uh, and we need it, and, and it, it matters. Uh, some other ways that we uh, are inviting people to step in involve just going to the Next Steps table and grabbing a paper that tells you about some classes that are coming up. Maybe you just want to dive in and learn more about what it looks like 
in this community for foster care. And we have classes that you can choose from that are low commitment, but I think really high level uh, information so that you can either decide to step in even further or to work with us to maybe find a different partner to serve. Uh, our wraparound families, that's a huge opportunity to step in and that is weekly sometimes daily or it can just be intermittently four times a year where you can connect mm -hmm. and then our foster care supply closet also provides just a, a a really cool way to have community and connection while walking out what god's told us to do and i think it's great so when i was growing up i often felt like, guilty for not getting involved or not doing enough not knowing where to start but i shouldn't feel that way right absolutely not no, I think that some of it is paying attention. Uh, we can't do everything. Right. Not everybody should be a foster parent. Uh, not everybody should step in and serve at the closet. Uh, I think a lot of what our hope as a church is, is to help you learn about yourself mm -hmm. and what God's gifted you to, but also what your passion is. If you find yourself, as we're talking about kids in crisis, if that stirs you and moves you, then we want to help you unpack that. But there are seasons of life, and there are also, frankly, just callings and passions that if this is something that that you're really feeling compelled to be part of we want to walk that out with you um, if it's not then drop off a bag full of gloves and and that's awesome and that's what our heart is not to overwhelm or to yeah. stress it's really to to invite yeah. you to learn to engage uh, and to walk it out however that looks for you and if nothing else to know what's going on to pray for the people involved uh, not only who are serving within our church, but also what's going on in our community, in our state. Uh, and then just tell people about it. Yeah. yeah. So if we just stand by, and do nothing, like maybe we've done for too long, mm. what's going to happen in our community? Yeah. What are we trying to avoid here? Well, I think one of the things that we're learning is, is we've been now in this ministry serving Kids in Crisis has existed for about two years now. And what we're finding is uh, the long-term effects of not only kiddos, but families in crisis, uh, where things are happening and parents don't want to not be able to take care of their kids. But life happens and they may not have the support that they need. And so it just starts unfolding. One of the things that we find is that that crisis uh, just continues to create other crises, not only in their lives, but then in, in the lives of people around them. It and snowballs. It really does snowball. And so our heart is, um, even through things at our church like Celebrate Recovery, where we wanna come alongside people and help them know who Jesus is and find healing and wholeness. And the sooner in their life that we have the opportunity to do that, the better our entire community is. We want hope and healing for everybody, and we know Jesus brings that. And so the more we can do to lean in with tangible things, like a coat and a hat and gloves, uh, to support foster families who are doing everything they can in the trenches to help these kiddos, the more people they have around them walking with them and encouraging them and supporting them, whether they go to our church or not. Again, we have the privilege of supporting so many families in this community, and we want to help other churches do that too. And it's other bigger organizations. than us, right? It's way bigger than us. But I think if we don't pay attention to it and step in and learn about it, I think we're just going to continue to see a lot of hurting people hurting a lot of people. Um, and, and our heart is that, that there would be healing and hope so that we're not having to do an all call about the number of foster kiddos right. who don't have homes to go to, uh, that, that families are being restored and children are being able to go back. And if they can't, then they're able to find foster families or adoptive families that can care for them too. Um, but a lot of it starts with just paying attention and leaning in. Um, and, and we're gonna keep doing that. Is it possible for us to eradicate kids in crisis? I would love to say yes. <laughs> I think that uh, throughout the Bible, and specifically Jesus makes it clear that there's, there's always gonna be pain in this world. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we can make life better, maybe not easier even all the time, but we can make it better when they know him and they're able to have people that are with them and for them and encouraging them. And I think it helps us be better too because the community that happens when we're supporting one another lifts us too. And then we can all be better neighbors and care, care more for one another. I think that our goal is, is not even to eradicate it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and maybe, maybe one day it will be, but our, 
our hope is to stop the fires that are happening, right. to, to lean in and say, this is not okay for this to be happening and us to not do anything yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, and then we wanna bring along as many people as we can to do that. So how many kids in our county are in need, you said, 400? There are over 400 right now. That's a lot. It is a lot. But it's not an impossible number. It's not, no. Like we can actually make a tangible difference. Yes. If we can take a chunk out of that mm -hmm. number. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely, and, and uh, that, that number is growing. The more that information gets out and that not only us, but other organizations that are sharing this need and empowering people, and not just empowering them, but educating them and then walking alongside them. Because it's not a catch and release where we say, oh, you want to foster? Fantastic. Go do it. Good luck. It's, it's just walking alongside and learning together, grieving together, celebrating together. It's discipleship. It's relationship. Uh, and so as that continues to happen and people feel supported, I think those numbers of care providers will grow. But also as we're providing support for families and helping them get healing and re restored, I think the numbers will continue to go down of kids that are even in need of care. Right. Uh, and so again, I think as, as a believer in this community, knowing about it, and in some way finding a space where you're mm -hmm. supporting people and caring about people, telling them about Jesus, I think all of those things together mm -hmm. help lessen the need and lift everybody up. As I think about fostering some a child, that sounds terrifying to me. <laughs> but the idea of knowing that there could be a wraparound family to come around with me, mm -hmm. and I'm not doing it alone, that makes it seem way more achievable. Oh, sure. Um, the whole wraparound concept is amazing because yes. I think it can feel like foster care is uh, something just I do or my family does. Yes. But it feels like what you're telling me is something that we do as a church and you aren't yes. alone when you foster, yes. right? Oh yeah, you. so our point of context, they're incredible. They, um, they really want to make sure that families know that they are seen mm -hmm. and they're valued and they're cared about. And so that could be just a text, it could be a dinner out, it could be them delivering a meal. Uh, one of the things that I know about the foster care community is it continues to deepen in the connection that they have with one another, not only for support, but also for resource, saying, I've got a kiddo that's struggling with this. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, I've had that same story, let me, let me t walk you through that. And um, being able to, even, even for the, a lot of our foster families have children of their own that they've either adopted mm -hmm. or, or that are just their birth kids. And um, so even being able to provide support for the, the kiddos involved mm -hmm. uh, has been really powerful, but that community and the depth of it mm -hmm. and how intentional our point of contacts are has really just helped to know that not only are you not alone, mm -hmm. but, but it helps you remember that God has called you into this and he's not gonna let you do it alone. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants to have people around mm -hmm. you to support you and carry, and that's the privilege of the body of Christ. Community. Yeah. So if you're in person today, if you're watching online, wherever you're at, yeah. watching it later this week, uh, what's your first step to get involved in this Kids in Crisis opportunity? Well, I think one of, one of the first ways, if you're not even sure where to start, is to just let us know who you are and that you want more information. <laughs> and then one of our team will just connect with you and take you for coffee or talk over the phone. Yeah. Uh, but just to share a little bit about what we're doing. And if you find a spot that you go, that's what I wanna, where I wanna start. Yeah. We, we know that it's, it's a pathway, it's not a pipeline. Things aren't pushing through mm. real fast. It's, <laughs> there are pathways because we wanna make it um, easy for people to connect yeah. wherever they are in their lives. And, and we each have our own pace too on the, on the we path. We do have our own pace, yeah. So, so wherever you're at, what season of life, even, even what you really loved it. We have somebody that loves to repair homes. And so he's on our call list. So if we have a foster family, that is in need of some home repairs, we call him. We have hunters who say, I'm gonna have a lot of meat in my freezer, so if you know of any families that need meat. And so it's it's as specific or as general as you want, but I think the first step is just to let us know you're interested. And if you, if you look over that list and go, I don't even know where to start, let us know that and we'll connect and just start a conversation. And I think that's, I think that's the best first next step for people. So, I think the best way to go about taking your next step is to go to our website, go to our mobile app, or on your way out today, if you're here live and in person, stop by the Next Steps table and they'll have some information for you. Maybe could it even answer some of your questions, uh, but just, just start somewhere.